uh, two words a lot at CE. We talk about evangelism. I think you probably picked that up by now. We really value lost people. I hope you do. We also uh, talk about the word discipleship. And I want to spend uh, the next few minutes just talking to you about what that really means. Because honestly, it's one of the words that we all know what it means, but we don't really know what it means. You know what I'm talking about there? We tend to think it's a program. We tend to think, uh, well, you know, discipleship is something that happens. Uh, you come to know Jesus, and then you get discipled because uh, you got to get grounded. So we're going to teach you how to confess sin, how to pray, how to read the scriptures, how to do this, how to do that. And within five weeks, you've been discipled. And then the other end of the spectrum is that we believe, well, you know what? There are some marine kind of Christians. Those that really want to drill down, those that get excited about God's Word, they actually meet in restaurants at 5 a.m. in the morning, and they study the scriptures in the original language, in the Hebrew. <laughs> and, and they just have this amazing idea about what discipleship, what the Word of God is, and they are on fire for Jesus. They've memorized the Old Testament, working through the New Testament. They, they have it all down. Those two things are perhaps portions of discipleship. But the word discipleship really has the idea of being an apprentice. Being an apprentice who serves under the master, who's becoming like the master. Serves under the master, who's becoming like the master, in this case Jesus. And, and they're going to reflect who he is in character on the inside and in priorities on the outside. So you've got to ask yourself the question, how in the world do we do that? And the American church loves programs. Have you noticed this? We really think, you know, if we could just package this puppy into a two-hour time block on Wednesday night, our student ministry would be amazing. We'd need to really be able to do it from 7 to 9 because I can't get my staff to show up any longer than that. So in a two-hour time block, that's what we really need to do. Uh, my mother-in-law passed away about two years ago. Uh, before she passed away, one of her favorite ways to spend her days was she loved to put together jigsaw puzzles. I personally think that people in hell are probably putting together jigsaw puzzles. <laughs> I can't prove that biblically. It's just an inclination, but it seems like that's what you do. When you, have, when, you, when you have a jigsaw puzzle, what you do, the key to putting together a jigsaw puzzle is to look at the picture. You look at the picture and you go, I'm trying to make that. And if you know anything about putting jigsaw puzzles together, the first things you look for are the... Corner pieces, exactly. Then you look for the edge pieces. Then you go around, you put all the blue pieces here, the red pieces here, the brown pieces here, the yellow pieces there. But if you miss, if you lose the picture, if you lose the cover of the box, it's going to be incredibly difficult to put that thing together. Here's what I want to throw out to you today. I think that many of us have forgotten there's a picture that we're trying to put together. And so we try to do this discipling thing, but we're not really sure what the picture looks like. And our students aren't really sure what the picture looks like. And I know we can be really spiritual and say, well, you're, you know, we're going to look like Jesus. I mean, I get all that. But honestly, what in the world does that mean? What does it mean to your students? So I, I want to try this morning to do a couple of things. I want to try to give you uh, four key words. They're my four key words. They don't have to be yours. But I want to give you those four key words as sort of an example of what a picture really could look like. If you were to come and look at my church or the student ministry in the church that I have the privilege of being the pastor of, the people would know, okay, those are the four words. That's what we're trying to become. So if you'd ask your students, what does a discipled person really look like, could they give you a concise, clear answer? My guess is in the average group, that's probably not going to happen. So here are the four key words that we would use. The first word is pursue. That you've got to passionately pursue Jesus. That's really the starting point, because it really is about this relationship. So you passionately pursue him so that you can get to know him and what he wants to do in your life, and you learn to listen to the Spirit of God. You passionately pursue him. Uh, my church is uh, probably 90% uh, white. Uh, white people crack me up. <laughs> Seriously, I'm one of them. But I, I mean, there, there could be, my church could be going through uh, th this uh, moment of ecstasy. And especially the guys that look like this. I'm going, do you have any kind of energy in your soul? Now, now 
that might be how I express passion. That might be how somebody else expresses passion. I'm not talking about the way it looks. I'm talking about this internal drive that you want to get to know God. You're going to passionately pursue him. I think that's the starting point. So the first word is pursue. Again, my words don't have to be your words. Second word that we use is the word change. I think God wants to radically change your students' lives. In order to change their lives, they're going to have to get to know him, right? That makes sense. They're going to have to get to know the word of God. They're going to have to apply it. So you pursue and then you change. Third key word is serve. Jesus said that uh, by this will all men know that you're followers of me because you're going to a big church. And say that, right? He said, because you have love one for another. Why did he have to say that? Because it is abnormal for us to love each other. Because I don't know about you, but I wake up in the morning, I'm thinking about me, not you. I tend to like me, not you. Now, I know I'm supposed to like you. I get it. But what if, what if we said, you know what? We're really going to teach our students, look for opportunities to serve others. And there's this thing that's going swept through the church and student ministries that, well, that's not my gift. Well, get over it. <laughs> you know, see a need, meet the need. That's, that's the deal. Look for opportunities to serve. What if your students would do that? What if they went to school and they said, you know what, who can I serve today? If they did that, they would have opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to just do real ministry. What's ministry? One person making a significant impact on one other person. That's what ministry really is. So you pursue, you change, you serve. Fourth key word that we would use, final key word, is the word seek. You seek lost people. Seek has the idea, I don't wait till they come to me, I go to them. I go to them and I'm going to look for an opportunity to really care for them because Jesus would do that. You would agree with that, right? Jesus would serve others. You would agree with that, right? Jesus was all about helping people to understand that they need to change in their character and in their priorities. And he said, you know what? I pursue my father. I spend time with him. Our students ought to really do that. If you could present a picture, and again, I'm not arguing those four words ought to be your four words. But what if you had your own four words? And if you like those four words, you can steal them for free. You don't even have to send us $3. You can send Ed, though, $2. He would be happy to take your money, okay? So pursue, change, serve, seek. If that's what it's all about, if we're trying to create this, this, this passion to pursue God, to change, to serve, to seek, and we call that the discipling process, how do you do that? Well, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this, you could do this. But I want to just give you one keyword. Anybody know there, there, are, there is one key to real estate? Anybody know the three words used with real estate? It's all about what? Location, location, location. You know where that comes from? New York City, the Hotel Pennsylvania. If you've ever been there, it's on 32nd and 7th Avenue. The guy built the hotel there and he said, we're going to build this hotel here. It has over 1,500 rooms and it's all about location, location, location. If you've been to Manhattan, you understand that. It is primo land. There's lots of people around there. In the same way, ministry is all about relationship, relationship, relationship. Very important that uh, by the providence of God, we looked at that First Thessalonians passage. Because that First Thessalonians passage says, you know, not only did we share with you the gospel of God, but what? We shared our lives with you. You had become dear to us. That doesn't happen in two hours a week. What is the key thing that your volunteer staff team does? I hope it's not bring the pretzels and the chips. I, I, I hope it's not keeping the kid in the back that always messes up and makes noise, keeping him quiet. I hope it's really building relationship, relationship, relationship. So what does that look like? Again, I want to give you three key words that you can use to uh, develop these relationships. And this is really for you and for your volunteer staff team. Because I'm going to argue that your ministry is not going to be successful because of you. It's going to be successful because of your staff team. You pour your life into them. They pour their lives into students. 
You know why, you know why most of us don't do that? We like students more than we like adults. It's true. You got to build a team. So what do you want your team to do? Three key words to build these relationships. First word is care. And, and care is, is maybe the easiest of the three words, but it really has the idea, I am going to spend time with you. I am just going to spend time with you. And you ever talk about quality time? So those of you that are married, you, you, go, you sit down with your spouse, and you go, so hey, let's have some quality time. Go ahead. Carol, you go first. She's going to look at me like, oh my word, you're on drugs. I'm going, yes, I am. Yes. Yes. Quality time is an accident that happens during quantity time. That's a great statement. By quality time is an accident that happens during quantity time. In other words, if you really want to drill down into a kid's life, you have got to spend a lot of time with them. You care for them. You're there. You, you, you talk about this, that, the other thing. Sometimes, you ever get tired of just talking about fluff? Yeah, I, I do. But you know what I've realized? Unless you talk about fluff, you rarely get to drill down and talk about what's really important. So talking about fluff has intentionality to it. You gotta care. Second word is you gotta share. You got to share and, and sharing is the idea of sharing with your students or in this case your staff sharing with students sharing with them what God is doing in their lives we tend to not do that and if you can't do that with other Christ followers I guarantee you you will not do that with lost people you got to share with them what God is doing in your life what's God been teaching you what are you struggling with right now you see, one of the wrong concepts about student ministry is, is that you've got to be a perfect person and have it all together to be this amazing staff person on a team. No, you don't. You just have to be less messy today than you were last week. That's the deal, right? So you begin to share with them gut-level honest issues. You care for them. You share with them. And, and, and you, you, you positively see what's going on in their lives. And when you see it, you tell them what you see. Tell them the positive things that you see. Really, when's the last time somebody came up to you and said, hey, just wanted to share with you. I, I really see a positive character quality in you. And I just think it's a really great, so good job. When's the last time somebody did that? We don't do that a whole lot. You need to look for the good in people and positively stroke them. So you care, you share. Here comes the most difficult of the three. But if you do the first two, this one is doable. It's the word challenge. You care, you share, you challenge. You're going to see an issue in their life. And now you've earned the right. That's a key phrase. You've earned the right to speak into their lives. And you challenge them. So, like, you're going to go away on a retreat. One of the things I would do with my team is I would circle the wagons. I would get all of my staff together, and I'd say, look, these are your three kids. These are your three kids. These are your three kids. Here's what I really need you to do. Before we get on the retreat, I want to challenge you to think about what area do each of your students need to be challenged in. And then when you're together for those two and a half days, you look for an opportunity as you're doing what? caring and sharing, to step in there and go, you know what, I really believe God wants to do this in and through your life. We tend to not do that because we over rely on the ability of the person up front to have this amazing expression of God's word, which I'm not saying we shouldn't teach God's word in a powerful way. When you teach from the front, what it does, it sets the table up for relationship interaction so you can go hey what do you think about what he said today I really think God wants to do this in your life you see a kid and you go you know what hey um, I could be wrong and that's one of the great phrases you learn to use I could be wrong but you know I, I, when, when I when I saw your dad drop you off here and I, I think I caught a little bit of interaction there and it seems to me like your tone was horrible like it, it seems like you disrespected your dad. Now, if I don't have a relationship with a person, I can't say that. Well, I could say it, but it won't go very well, right? 
So, but if I have a relationship and if the kid knows, hey, he cares about me, I've earned the right to be heard in that person's life. So what would happen if your staff team understood, here's what the picture looks like, here's what we're trying to produce, here's how we do it, relationship, relationship, relationship. What we do to make that happen is we care for students, we share with them, and then we challenge them. What would happen if we took that seriously? I think that lives would be impacted. And you know what would happen then? Your students would go, hmm, maybe I could do that. You see, you're modeling for them what real life-on-life -life ministry is all about. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to take a moment, just by yourself, go before God and say, God, um, think about three of your students and think about what's the, what's the next step? What's the next thing they need to be challenged in? Ask him to clearly lay on your heart, what should I challenge these three students in? Take about three or four minutes to do that. I'm going to bring us back and pray. We'll wrap this up.